Good morning. It's Mother's Day. Yeah, I'm excited too. That video was the cutest thing. I can't make it through anything like that without crying. And those weren't even my kids, but that was really cute. So cute. If you didn't know it was Mother's Day and this was your heads up, good luck to you. You have about till the end of this message to come up with like, you know, a quick little celebration to celebrate the special ladies in your life. But I figured before um, I got started, we should celebrate our moms one more time. Um, if you are a mom or a grandma or if you're a mother figure, can you stand up? And we want to bless you today. And I want to pray for you, all of the women, stand up and just reach out your hand, touch them, put your arm around them. And I want to pray for the mamas today. Jesus, we just thank you for these women. We know, Jesus, that your own mom was so important to you. Even as you were dying on the cross, you thought about your mom. And you mentioned your mom. And you made sure that she was okay, Lord. And we just thank you, God, for these people's sacrifice. Because it is a sacrifice to be a mom. It is amazingly wonderful. But it is a sacrifice. And they've sacrificed their time and their energy to raise up the next generation. And they've sacrificed a lot of sleep. Jesus, and we just thank you for these ladies today, God, and we just declare a double portion flowing over for these women today that they feel honored and blessed, God, in Jesus' name. Thank you, mamas. In Jesus' name. Haven't we had some really incredible services lately? Worship today was ridiculous. That was so good. We've also had, um, recently we've had the Bethel team with Peter and Lisa Haynes, was amazing. We had Cheyenne Eakin, that was amazing. We had our own worship and healing night, which was so cool. So many people were healed and were able to recognize their freedom in Christ that night. And I was like, man, God is doing something really big. And I don't know if I'm the only one that has been feeling like this really intense, like we're on the cusp of something really big. Um, and it's, I mean, it's like this different feeling, you know, like it makes me think of that, like inhale right before that, like gigantic exhale of like something really big is happening. And I don't know exactly what he's doing, but it's really big and it's really cool. Um, even Easter this year felt different for me. I don't know if anybody else like felt that, but for me it was like, so I homeschool my kids. And um, so all during Holy Week, I was teaching them about the days that we're celebrating. We're celebrating the Last Supper, and we're celebrating, you know, Good Friday. And this is what that means, and, you know, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And this is what the cross and the resurrection meant. And I'm explaining all of these things every single day, and we're talking about it. And every single time, I would end in tears, bawling my eyes out, and they're probably like, cool, oh, Mom, that's a great, you know, that's a great story. But it just felt like this extra like intensity this year, which is really, I don't know, I'm excited. I feel like we're on the cusp of something really, really big. Yeah, it's really cool. Um, but growing up, for me, Easter, the death and resurrection, what the cross meant, um, was entirely different for me growing up as it is for me in my adulthood. Um, because my interpretation of the cross um, meant salvation. It meant being saved. A great and wonderful gift. But nonetheless, a gift for when I'm dead. And I'm not, now I'm not downplaying the gift of salvation. Eternal life. It's exciting and it's amazing and we get to look forward to that. But the Lord gave me um, a picture, a vision of it being Christmas morning and you're sitting down with your family, and you've got this present on your lap, and you're ready to unwrap it, and you're so excited, it's Christmas. And you unwrap the wrapping paper, and he showed me, he said, that wrapping paper is my gift of salvation. That's the thing that's like, you open it, and you're so excited. And he said, but you know what else, though? There was a box inside, and that's where the real treasure was at, and you'd completely missed it. You never opened the box that there was something different for right now, for the moment that I said yes to Jesus, that moment that I came into agreement that he died for me, that not only did I get salvation, but I got a completely changed physical identity, that I became entirely different, 
completely filled with the fullness of God. So I didn't know that, but I read this um, from a speaker, and I'm going to read it to you because this was how he described it, the real treasure. The Father himself had an original design for you from the beginning where there is no beginning. When he started to dream up this age and these people and this world, he spent the equivalent amount of time as a master designer craftsman of millions of years just on you, dreaming of what you'd be like, dreaming of the best version of you. And we moved away from that, but he came and he paid a price, not just so we can go to heaven, but he's like, okay, I paid this price for them, but you know, they're still kind of messy. No, he paid the price so we can be restored to God's original design for us. And when we hear God's heart, we start to see that original design and intentions for our lives that he spent this time beautifully crafting. And that's the thing. That's where the real treasure was, that I became entirely physically different the moment that he died for me. It was a complete revision of what sin had taken from me, where I thought I was anything less than his beautiful child full of goodness. A complete revision, not a to be continued, not like a, oh, this is really great, now I can't wait for heaven, for the real prize. Yes, that is part of it. But there was a treasure inside for right now that I get to live out the rest of my days entirely, completely filled with the Holy Spirit, all of the gifts of the Spirit, and I get to live my life entirely changed, restored to his original design. He spent that time thinking of the best version of me. And because he chose to die and save me, I get to live with that as my identity, with that as the real treasure. See, for a long time, though, in my life, I didn't understand that. I only saw the wrapping paper of salvation. I didn't see the real treasure. Um, I did not grow up in a charismatic church at all. So the physical manifestations of the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, healings, what have you, super, super foreign to me. I had not been around any of that. And God started to unravel for me what the gift of the cross really was when, um, this was about nine years ago, actually. I don't know if you guys all remember this. Those of you that were there nine years ago, a lot of the family was. My husband and I were at camp. We were helping at camp. And we weren't married yet. We were engaged. And see, okay, my husband grew up in this church where the physical manifestations, yes, of the cross and the Holy Spirit were a normal day. He had prayed for, he- for healing. People had been healed. He grew up with family, speaking in tongues every single day. That was like a normal way of life, and I did not. And we were at camp, helping. We were the camp helpers, right? We were engaged at church camp, and uh, we got in a fight. Guess what we got in a fight about? The Holy Spirit. (laughs) Because, see, um, my husband was trying to tell me that if you have received Christ and you have received the Holy Spirit, then you have access to all of the gifts of the Spirit, and the Lord has hidden nothing from you. How dare he? The horror. How could you? Yes. Um, Okay, but I have to totally side note here for a second. Um, And I'll get back to our sweet little argument at church camp where we were the helpers and supposed to be leadership. But how interesting that Christians, myself included, because this is what I was going through, will sit there and scoff at and overanalyze the power of the Holy Spirit, and yet the, en- the enemy and evil spirit power regularly accepted and believed and feared. Like, we're ready to jump and go and be like, oh, oh my goodness, that's weird. No, 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 I'm not going to be subjected to that evil power. Not today, Satan. And yet the power of the Holy Spirit, we're going to be like, Was it really, though? Is that really the Lord? And that's okay. I know. I'm sorry. I had to. Because that's what I was dealing with. That's what I was going through. And yet, Holy Spirit power, right? We accept it at a distance. 
Like, yes, I fully believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. Like, in the African bush, when I heard once that somebody's hearing was healed. But here in America, in church? Ooh! You know what? It's probably that powerful evil spirit again pretending to be like Christ. I'm just saying, this is where I was at. The overanalyzing and the, are you sure? But what if we chose to believe first? What if, follow me here, what if my first response wasn't skepticism, but belief? That's where I was at. So I felt like it needed to be said. Because that's how I was feeling at camp. And we were arguing about the power of the Holy Spirit. Because I didn't grow up with that experience. So there we were. We had this argument. And that night, we go to the main service. And the speaker is speaking. And he doesn't know me. And I don't know him. He does not know my growing up experience. He doesn't know my relationship with Christ or my belief system or anything else. He does not know me. And I do not know him. And at the end of that service, he points at me and he says, I have a word for, the, for, for you from the Lord. This was the first prophetic word that I had ever received in my life, the day that we got in a fight about the power of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and I just stood up, just weeping, sobbing, ugly crying, because for the first time in my entire life, I felt fully seen and fully known, and that the power of God saw me, not only in a room full of people, but he saw me out of the entire world. He saw me, and he had something for me. And the, the speaker, over and over, he said, God sees the good in you. 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 Over and over and over, he repeated this. And there was a lot more to the word. But that part just like wrecked me because that was not my interpretation of God. My interpretation of the Holy Spirit and of God was that he had to be perpetually disappointed in me and ashamed in me. And he was the God that every single day, day in and day out, when I'm driving in my car, when I wake up, when I go to bed, I'm constantly, Lord, please forgive me, please forgive me, please forgive me. Because what if I just happened to like out of the blue, keel over and die, and I hadn't asked for forgiveness for something, and then I'm going to go to hell. And it was constantly this fear-based relationship with Christ. And in that moment, he saw the entirety of me. And he didn't say anything else, but I see goodness. I see the good in you. What? Because he's that good. But see, here's the thing, though. We have these things. I'm going to call them truth filters. And they're these things that tell you, that interpret, I guess, is a way to say it. Interpret your situations around you. And so this unconscious truth filter is continuously developing what you see as true or not true. What you see as reality or not reality all the time, even from childhood. You are developing this truth filter of how you interpret and how you see the world. It's your belief system. So like, for instance, my husband and I can be in the exact same room at the exact same party with the exact same people, and we're going to interpret it differently. We're probably going to get in the car, and I'm going to be like, oh my goodness, I should probably apologize for something. I don't think those people like me. That was so awkward. And he's going to get in the car and be like, that was not awkward at all. Those people love me. Because our truth filters are interpreting situations differently. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Same general kind of experience. Four different interpretations. Four different truth filters that showed them their interpretation of it, right? So from the moment we're born, these are beginning to be transformed. And our belief system starts to be transformed about, um, about marriage, about God about humility, about relationships. So for instance, an infant that experiences neglect, their unconscious truth filter is going to tell them, you can't trust people. And in their adult life, they might form attachment disorders. If kids grow up in a family where their parents are um, screaming at each other as forms of communication when they disagree, 
then their unconscious truth filter tells them that that is the proper way to communicate with one another. In the same way, if kids grow up with parents who apologize, they see their parents apologize to each other and apologize to their children, then they're going to grow up with the mindset that apologizing is nothing to be embarrassed about, that that's a normal way of life. Because that's what your unconscious truth filter is telling you to believe, right? So it's really important to reflect on what your truth filter is telling you. What's your belief system? What's your belief system about God? And see, that moment at camp for me, when God started revealing his goodness by telling me, I see you, I see every single part of you, and I see goodness. He started revealing to me that he didn't die just for salvation for when I die. He died so that I can live out the rest of my days entirely different where he sees goodness and I walk with my head held high from a new perspective. That my place has changed from slavery to sonship. But the beginning of that, that word, my first prophetic word there at camp, was this really transformation, transformational period of understanding who he was, but I still had this truth filter issue. The way that I was interpreting God. And he started to kind of like reveal that to me. And he said, hey, I love you very much. But I need to take you back to the beginning. We need to revamp a few things about the way that you see me. I need to show you my nature. So he did. He took me back to the beginning, the very beginning. So if you want to, you can turn with me to Genesis 3. And Adam and Eve, they had just sinned. See, I didn't tell you. Genesis 3.20. Adam and Eve had just sinned. And it says they instantaneously felt shame. And what did they do? They forgot his nature. They forgot who he was. They forgot who they were. And they ran and they hid. In Genesis 3.20, Then the man Adam named his wife Eve because she would be the mother of all who live. And the Lord God made clothing from animal skins for Adam, for his wife. Then the Lord God said, look, the human beings have become like us, knowing both good and evil. What if they reach out, take fruit from the tree of life, and eat it? Then they will live forever. So the Lord God banished them from the Garden of Eden, and he sent Adam out to cultivate the ground from which he had been made. After sending them out, the Lord God stationed mighty cherubim to the east of the Garden of Eden, and he placed a flaming sword that flashed back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. So, my old truth filter was telling me that God was angry. He was mad at his kids. He banished them because how could they? They did the one thing he told them not to do. And he was mad. And he said, I'm sorry, you don't get to live in this place anymore. But as he began to renew my mind and revamp my truth filter, he started, he brought me back to this and he said, hold on, you're interpreting this wrong. Actually, I was being merciful to my children. He said, oh my goodness, I love my kids so much that I would never, ever, 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 ever want them to live forever if they had to live in shame any way apart from the way that I had created them to live with their complete freedom, knowing who they are and knowing who I am. Because remember, they forgot and they ran and hid. He did not. I was like, what? I've been reading this so wrong, Lord. Because if you continue reading... He didn't stay in the safety and the perfection of the garden. He went out with his kids where their new home was. It show, if you continue reading on, he knew their children by name. He walked with them, and I like to think, maybe it's the mom and me, but I like to think he was with Eve when she was giving birth to her kids because he was with his children. They forgot who they were. They ran and hid. He did not. He said, I love you too much too much to have to have you live forever if it's any way apart from the way that I originally designed you to be without shame. Okay. All right. So my interpretation 
of the word of God and the stories in the Bible were out of context because they were skewed, they were from a skewed truth filter. And I would never have the correct understanding of the nature of God if he didn't correct that interpretation. And he said to you, you will never understand who you are if you don't understand who I am. You have to interpret me correctly before you can interpret you correctly. So he started showing me time and time and time again through the word where I was just viewing it from a skewed truth filter. So he started showing me, okay, now you're beginning to know me. Now you can know you. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he has received new life. He is a new creation. Yes. Titus 3, 4-7. But when God our Savior revealed his kindness and love, he saved us not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. He generously poured out the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ our Savior because of his grace. He declared us righteous and gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life Amen. and again Ephesians 4 17 through 24 with the Lord's authority I say this live no longer as the Gentiles do for they are hopelessly confused their minds are full of darkness and they wander far from the life God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. But that isn't what you learned about Christ. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your what? New nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Yeah. Not once there does it say you've received a new spirit that you're just washed clean like in your mind and then you will go to heaven someday where then you get to be free. You have received new life. You are a new creation. That is a physical truth. Amen. That the moment that you accept Christ, that you say, I know you died for me. I accept you. He starts to renew your mind and you begin to see, I am completely new now. Not a to be continued, a sign seal delivered, the finished work of the cross. He spoke to me that day at camp, and he said, you no longer need to continue with this mindset of, I want to get freed. I need to seek your heart. I need to beg for mercy. Because that moment that I accepted him, what his cross paid for was the fullness of Christ. I have his mercy. I have the fullness of his heart. I am completely freed. And over and over and over and over, the word says, time and time again, you have received new life. You are a new creation. Done finished see for me I feel like though that's like the greatest ploy of all mankind the most destructive lie that Christians have ever believed because see when the enemy sorry when Christ died the enemy lost all of his power the veil was torn the enemy lost all of his power so his only defense from here on out was to lie to creation that nothing had really changed. I guarantee you that he would fully admit, yeah, 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 he totally won. You're saved. Yes, you're saved. When you die, you get to experience eternal life. But if the believers, if the saints, if the people that have received new life and are new creations don't believe that anything is different in them for right now, he can, continue, can continue to meddle and meddle and meddle because we haven't accepted the new identity. We haven't allowed our mind to be renewed from this place of slavery to the place of sainthood, from pauperhood into the palace, where he said, like he said in Ephesians, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. When he started to reveal that lie to me, that I think we've believed that there's nothing different in us, that there's nothing changed for right now. 
he started showing me something else. So this is around the time that I started hearing the term the grace movement. And it was kind of referring to churches um, that were focused mostly on grace. You were here all of these sugar-coated messages. And I would kind of sit at home and scoff, like, okay, yeah, I believe in grace, but there's more. You need to do better. You need to stop sinning. You need to have faith. You need to be righteous. All of these things that I'm like, there's more. There's more than just grace. And the Lord, in his sweet kindness, <laughs> he said, do you believe in salvation by works? And I was like, no. I know that a lot of belief systems believe in salvation by works, but not mine. And he's like, hmm, are you sure? And I started to like think about my belief system, what was in my truth filter. I did think that. I did think that there was something that I had to do and be and try all the time and fail. And the next day, get back up and try and try and try and fail. And it was just this continuous cycle, not an understanding of my position. Fully created, like he said, to be righteous and holy. So I looked it up. I looked up the word grace in Webster's Dictionary, and you know what it said? The definition of grace to honor by one's presence, to add dignity to by one's presence. To honor by one's presence, to add dignity to by one's presence. So by the literal presence of the Holy Spirit, he has created you with dignity, with honor. That's what you have received. If you have received the fullness of the Holy Spirit, you have received dignity and you have received honor. Because your position changed the moment that you came into agreement that he died for you. And you never have to work again. Some of you are old enough to remember Oprah on TV. Some of you probably aren't. Don't tell me if you're not. But if you remember Oprah on TV, you'll remember that you get a car and you get a car and you get a car. And it cracked me up because it's honestly kind of like that. And you get grace and you receive dignity and you receive freedom over and over and over again. So if I've received that, free of anything that I've done, what do I do? So he showed me, Matthew 11, 28 and 29. Then Jesus said, come to me all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens and I will give you what? I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. It's easy to bear and it's light because it's rest. Because you just get to rest in the presence of your daddy while he lavishes his love on you. He showed me again. Exodus 33, 14. Moses. I love Moses. I feel like I relate to Moses because time and time again the Lord is faithful to Moses and time and time again Moses freaks out. And I feel like I can understand that on a personal level. The Lord had freed the Israelites. He was having a conversation with Moses, and once again, Moses is freaking out. They're going toward the promised land, and Moses is like, God, I don't want to do it if you're not with me. And God says, I will personally go with you, Moses, and I will give you rest. Everything will be fine for you. Because my job is to rest. And Moses' job is to rest. That's why it's easy. You get to stop trying. You get to rest. He gave me this um, vision of, this was probably like a year ago, the Lord did. He gave me this vision of a mailbox. And somebody goes and puts cookies in my mailbox. Is this a hint to do that? Maybe. Take it how you want it. <laughs> he gives me this vision of cookies in a mailbox. That moment that somebody puts them in there, those are my cookies. It is illegal for anybody else to go take my cookies out of my mailbox. They are mine. 
but I still have the ability to agree that they're mine. I can walk to my mailbox and I can take those cookies out and I can taste and eat and see that it is good, or I can leave them there and not acknowledge them. It doesn't make those any less mine. Still mine. My identity is still mine, whether I acknowledge it or not. That grace is free for me, still mine, my new identity. I get to rest whether I see it or not. I can taste and see that it is good. Or I can ignore it and continue to live in this way where I try, try, try again. And never get to the place of righteousness. Never feel that I am in the place of righteousness. But remember, in Ephesians, he declared us righteous and holy with dignity. Right? But see, I needed to kind of explain all of this first, this journey that the Lord was taking me on, before I explain this next part. Because I needed to make sure that we had the right context. Because quite often in the Word, your truth filter might get a little skewed if you're reading out of context. And I needed to give you context because we needed to talk about our new nature. And we also needed to talk about the position of rest because I did not want this to get confused. But about a month ago, during the week, I was feeling the Lord speak to me um, in his gentle kindness. He was saying, hey, you have had all of these amazing words spoken over you. You have been called anointed. You have been called set apart. I have told you these things specifically. When are you going to take that on as your identity? When are you going to agree? Because, see, I didn't realize at the time that I wasn't agreeing. But my response to these moments when the Lord would speak to me directly or I would receive a prophetic word from somebody else that I was kind of going, oh, thank you. That's so nice. Oh my goodness, I receive it. Thank you. But I wasn't living with this as my completely revamped and changed identity. Being clothed entirely different from this place of sonship. Not from pauperhood, not from slavery, but somebody who lives in the palace with my head held high, walking with the power of the Holy Spirit in me. Okay. Yeah, God, you're right. You're totally right. Thank you so much for bringing my attention to this. Thank you, Jesus. I agree. You're so right. And at the end of that week, the Bethel team was here, and uh, I received an amazing prophetic word during the service. And after the service, our guitar player, Josh, also had a word from the Lord for me. And Josh and I know each other, but we haven't known each other long enough for him to know that nine years ago, the word that I had received then was the exact same word that he gave me, but with more relevance to my life now. Same word. He didn't know that, but I went home so excited and like expectant, like, whoa, God's doing something really great. I'm so excited. And the next two weeks, I sat there in like heaviness. And I didn't know why. And I was just like, oh, this is so hard. I don't know what's going on, Lord. And I sat on my kitchen counter talking to my husband and bawled my eyes out, ugly crying, like the whole thing. Because I'm tired, I was tired of being stretched out of my comfort zone. And I remember telling him like, why does it seem like my entire life is now becoming this place out of my comfort zone? Why can't it be like consistent vacation? Why can't that be the thing? And I sat there crying to him, and I said, I want to say no. I want to say no to Jesus. Because I'm tired of feeling this way. This is really hard. It's harder than I thought. It's hard to feel outside of my comfort zone all the time. And I want to say no. I want a regular Christian experience where I go to church, and I love Jesus, and I tell my kids about Jesus, and I love him, but it's regular. It's not being up front. It's not being in front of people. It's not being stretched out of my comfort zone. And I'm sure he was like trying to tame the beast. And he's like, it's okay, you can say no. <laughs> and that's the thing. Like, I could say no because my blessing isn't subjected to that. The Lord doesn't leave me if I said no. He would still love me. And I bet you he'd come running right after me. 
But the thing is, I said, you don't understand. I can't say no. Because my heart will never be satisfied if I say no. I have to agree. I have to experience more. I have to have more knowledge and more understanding of my identity. I have to understand more of his nature and his goodness. I will never be satisfied if I say no. He has more for me. And I feel like the Lord has been bringing me into this place where I have a choice. My position is rest. And I didn't want that to get confused. My position is rest in sonship, daughtership. But my choice is to agree or not. I can say, yes, Lord. I give you permission to change my truth filter. I give you permission to change my perspectives on who you are and on who I am. Or I can live in my comfort zone. Or I can allow you to rip it open and continue to give me more and more and more freedom. You said I have it. I have it all, but I want to show you. Let me show you. My position is rest. My choice is agreement. And I just really feel like the Lord is raising up a deliverer generation. I feel like he is raising up people that are ready to silence the lies of the enemies from a generation that says, wait a second, there's something that has changed here. The atmosphere is different. That as believers, that when we walk into a room, that the atmosphere changes because our identity is different. And now we're walking from a place of authority, not from a place with my hung held because I'm constantly screwing up. This weight is heavy to bear. It's light because he already declared it and you come from a place of agreement. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, my identity is different. Yes, Lord, I have been changed. Yes, Lord, you are good. And I get to agree with my daddy in this generation, this deliverer generation that is coming, that is being risen up right now are people that he's already changed. We've already been changed. But we get to silence that ploy, those lies. No more are we going to live from a place where we're expectant of, the, well, the world is going to crash and burn, so might as well brace ourselves for it. No. We're coming from a place where his saints are ready to rise up. We get to rest, but we also get to say, I will never be satisfied. I will never be satisfied with regular again. He said, I'm his kid. So I'm going to walk like one. He said, I'm filled with the fullness of his Holy Spirit. So I'm going to walk in that. So when I walk into a room, the atmosphere is going to change and people are going to be healed and shame is going to fall off and guilt is going to go. Because he already did it. The enemy is the only one that wants us to think that nothing has been changed for right now. Because then that's the only way that the saints don't rise up and walk in their identity and their truth. And I just want to take a minute. And I I want to pray for people. Um that feel like they maybe haven't acknowledged it, that they're different. Maybe you haven't fully experienced the power of the Holy Spirit. Maybe you're like me and you're like, okay, this is foreign to me. And I just, if it's you, if you are somebody that wants to say, I agree, then can we just get our prayer team to come up here? And can we just take a minute If you want to say, you know what, I know, I know I believe him and I know that I am saved, but I'm ready to agree that something is different for right now, then I want you to feel free 
to come up here because these people on our prayer team, they're amazing. And we've all been growing to this place of understanding that we are free. And I just want to close us in prayer because some of us have some wonderful Mother's Day fun. But if you want to say, I want to come into agreement and walk in my position, with my position being his child, being an heir, fully receiving, then we fully invite you to come up and receive. Because God always has more. If there's ever a time where you're like, does he want me does he want to say something? Does he not? Yes, he does. Every time. Every single time. Every single time he wants to say something. Every single time he wants to do something. He does not hold himself back. The heavens are about to break open. Jesus, God, we just recognize you today, Father. We are excited for what you are doing. We are thankful that you paid for a new identity. You are gracious and you are kind and you are loving. And God, we just thank you for the renewing of our truth filters. We thank you, God, for renewing our minds from any lies we may have believed about you, Father. We repent, Lord, from any fogged identity covered Lord separate from what you paid for Jesus we just thank you for your goodness we thank you for your presence we thank you for your fullness of your spirit God we thank you Lord that you are going to continue you said you have received my fullness but time and time and time and time again, I want to reveal more to you. Jesus, we agree today. We agree that this is what you paid for. We agree that there was more than just salvation for the future. That my position is different for now, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for your faithfulness, Father. Father.